The experience of lifetimes are yours to discover. From the front lines abroad to the front porches at home, from World War I to today, your journey into wartime America begins in Nampa at the Warhawk Air Museum. Thomas R. Young was born in Tennessee on September 24, 1922. He was raised in a loving household in the Depression, so he grew up poor, but in his own words, so did everyone else. He graduated from high school in 1940 as rumblings of war were beginning to visit Europe, though this didn't concern him greatly in high school. By the time he got to college, however, many of the young men that he grew up with were beginning to sign up for service. Always drawn to the skies, Tom applied to join the Air Corps shortly after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. I finished my sophomore year in college. I did not go back for my junior year because I knew I would be called. So I worked from that point, I worked for my, with my father in the construction of a hospital in Memphis for military people. I spent the next 10 months working with him. Um, got married um, and uh, within two months of our marriage, I received orders to report to Miami Beach. Tom's air training would take him to Miami, Decatur, Santa Ana, and Tucson, Arizona. At the last of these, he faced some personal enmity with one of his instructors, which at one point seemed enough to wash him out of the entire program. And I forgot our first anniversary because I was so concerned about washing out of the program. Tom would not wash out. He would go on to further training in Roswell, New Mexico, Omaha, Nebraska, and finally Sioux City, Iowa, where he and his crew were minted and ready to be shipped out to war. I reported to, to Kearney, Nebraska. There I was given a brand new B-17. Uh, we were briefed on flying the, the aircraft to England, across the Atlantic. Um, we set out to, uh, of course, at this point, knowing that we were leaving, we had left family behind. And we were, at this point, all, all everything was dedicated to getting us into combat. But Tom and his crew made their way, in a roundabout fashion, to Italy, where they wound up attached to the 774 Squadron of the 436th Bomb Group out of Foggia, Italy. They quickly distinguished themselves, and after only five missions, Tom's was the lead plane in the formation. At that point on, then, I was flying uh, as whenever the group, whenever our squadron drew the lead position, then I flew as the squadron lead. From Italy, we were reaching targets in uh, the southeastern part of Europe. We flew into Germany, Austria, Romania, Bulgaria. Greece, Yugoslavia, um, I, all those areas. In the time that I flew, uh, I made each of those countries about three times, various targets. Uh, usually, of course, uh, railroad yards, marshalling yards, uh, manufacturing plants, uh, bridges. We bombed a lot of bridges in Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. By this point in the war, the Luftwaffe had suffered heavy casualties and were unable to effectively contest the skies over southern Germany with aircraft of their own. But flak was another problem. We lost aircraft on almost every mission, flying into targets like Munich and uh, uh, into the major cities of, of these other countries. By November 16, 1944, Tom had flown 18 missions but his 19th was to be a step too far. The morning of November 16th, 1944, started off much as many of his others had. We were rather anxious to get off the ground because weather had kept us uh, on the ground for, for several days. Uh, generally, we were flying every day, but it had been several days. So I was, I was ready to fly that particular day. Um, the skies had cleared. We were predicting to have good weather all the way. Our target was Munich. 
the most dreaded of all the targets, the most heavily defended city in the southern part of Germany. Tom would never make it to Munich. The lead plane in the lead group with his squadron commander in his co-pilot seat. They took off from Munich, but partway through the flight, a confused recall came over the airwaves. There was some debate as to whether or not to turn back. Major Compton, Tom's commanding officer, eventually decided to turn around. But on the way back to Foggia, changed his mind and ordered Tom's group to rejoin the attack. However, by this point, they were too far behind the formation. No way to attack a place as heavily defended as Munich. Instead, a secondary target was chosen. Innsbruck in Austria. So we made a bombing run that day on Innsbruck, Austria, at an altitude of 30,000 feet. Seven aircraft in the group, the only ones who had de deferred from the initial target. Uh, we had dropped our bombs after a successful run, and I was turning the aircraft into a turn to the right to lead the, the group back toward the base by way of the Adriatic Sea, when BAM! We hear a tremendous explosion and the plane rocks. And we hear the hissing of oxygen escaping and uh, smell uh, the hydraulic fluid pouring out of broken lines. And we were racked over into a hard right turn and we're dropping through the sky. We lost two engines. As the reports later said, uh, the aircraft was last seen under control, having lost altitude. And that was the last official record of us. This photograph, taken by a crewman on another bomber, shows Tom's plane in the seconds between taking contact and the fire being put out by his crew chief. The crew did their best and did manage to, against the odds, limp their aircraft back across the Alps into northern Italy. The plane was too far gone, and they were forced to bail over northern Italy. Tom himself found himself in a cornfield, alone. He had been the last man to bail out of the aircraft, so upon gaining his composure, he buried his secret codes and thought for a brief moment about what to do next. Jumped to my feet, just in time to be approached by two young Italian soldiers with some machine guns. Uh, we were very explicit in the orders to get my hands in the air quickly, which I did. A little bit of Italian that I knew, I asked, are you good Italians? And they said, for you, not so good. Tom had landed in one of the last remaining German-controlled bits of northern Italy. The Italian soldiers took him into town, where he was housed, fed, interrogated, and handed over to the Germans. I began to have the feeling that I was taking part in a grade B Hollywood movie. All of a sudden the incitement intensifies and a, and a, a car pulls up out in front and a German major steps out. Uh, again, it's uh, said, uh, this casting is wonderful. This is just like the last movie I saw. The German with his tight cropped trousers and his little short built cap and his tight tunic and ribbons across his chest. And, he has a little riding crop in his hand as he steps out of the automobile and he marches up to me and I, of course, I caught him off guard by saluting as we'd been told to do if we were captured. And he says something to me that was sort of like a, a phrase from a, a, a school book in English. It had nothing to do with the situation, but it was English and he impressed his soldiers by speaking English. I, I didn't even know how to reply to him. I wish I knew what it was that he said. I just remember it was so humorous at the time. Most of Tom's crew escaped. A handful of his crew members wound up being rescued by Italian and Yugoslavian partisans and fought in those movements for the remainder of the war. Major Compton was rescued by partisans and through a series of underground connections returned to the United States within two months. But Tom 
and two of his other crew members were captured by the Germans. They were held for a brief time in Italy and then moved north to Germany. Um, we were fed okay, uh, soup, uh, mostly beans and cabbage. Eventually, Tom was placed in the famous Stalag Luft III prison camp of the Great Escape fame. While there, he was reunited with a childhood friend of his. So we had a grand reunion. We were given chances to write two postcards for the Germans at that point. One, I sent one home to my mother, and one home to my, to my wife. On my mother's postcard, I said at the bottom of it, just uh, as an afterthought, I said, Leighton McLaren is in the camp with me. Several weeks later, that postcard reached the local post office in my hometown. The post office was half a block up from the bakery where late McLaurin's parents lived and worked. The postman read the postcard, ran down the street, yelling at the top of his voice, Ms. McLaurin, Leighton is alive, Leighton is alive. They had never heard one word about his condition except that he was missing in action. And that postcard, by sheer chance, was the first word they had that he was alive. In sharp contrast to the treatment of Russian prisoners and of those caught up in the Holocaust, the Germans treated Western prisoners fairly well, especially airmen. There are isolated stories of atrocities, but for the mo most part, we were treated with great fairness. So life wasn't bad, except we were generally always cold and generally always felt like we could eat a little bit more if we had the opportunity. While a prisoner, Tom, who had trained as an artist before the war, took up the drawing of cartoons for the camp newspaper and for other prisoners. One of my roommates, uh, cell, cellmates, or however you might want to call it, had given me a, a a diary book, and I started putting illustrations in that and drawings and sketches and swapping with other artists, and that became a pastime for me. So I was able to come out of that experience then with the bits and pieces of little cartoons I had done in the situation. And uh, they've meant a lot to me and uh, uh, have helped me to keep a sense of perspective about it all. But Tom's amicable captivity was coming to an end. As 1944 turned into 1945, the Russians were pushing into East Germany. The camp was to be evacuated. Prisoners were made to run laps around the yard to ensure that they were physically fit enough to survive the ordeals ahead. Backpacks were made out of blankets, so what few possessions they had could be brought with them. The place we were going to march to was a rail junction the railroad nearest to Saigon had been knocked out already by the Russian guns, and so we had to walk to Spremberg, which was three days away. It was a dead of winter. The temperatures were down to freezing. It was heavy snow on the ground. Um, and we started walking 10,000 Allied prisoners in this long, straggling line. And the Germans had no way, really, of handling the situation. Uh, it took us the three days to make that walk. Along the way, many of them dropped out. Uh, my best friend in, in my room, who had given me the little book that I cherish so much, uh, I never saw again because he couldn't make it. He fell out and was, uh, we expected he would be picked up by horse and wagons that were coming along the way that the Germans used it for those who couldn't walk. But uh, I never did see him again. Tom and his fellows marched to Spermberg. From there they were taken by rail to Nuremberg where they were housed in the athletic facilities previously built by Hitler. We spent two months there in somewhat less than the happy conditions we'd had in the previous camp. We watched Nuremberg being bombed at night by the Allies and by the Germans, by, excuse me, by the English mosquito squadrons. Uh, cheered like guys at a football game as the B-17s and B-24s would soar overhead and drop in their bombs on Nuremberg until the Germans would become angry and drive us back into the buildings. And, 
uh, managed to get through that. As the war came to a close, Tom and the other prisoners being held in Nuremberg were made to march by foot to the town of Muschberg in southern Germany, near Munich, in a last effort by Hitler to keep the prisoners as some sort of collateral. Nonetheless, when the Germans surrendered in May 1945, Tom and his fellow prisoners were free. The tanks came rolling in, and there was a great celebration. The German guards who had been walking along with us threw their guns over the fences into the, and began to find their friends that they had made among the Americans and making contacts. And from that point on, we, we were free Americans again, and all we had to do was wait until they came to get us. And these pilots delighted in taking us to our new liberty, and they flew over Paris and circled the Eiffel Tower, and we, we just had a great time being, being liberated. It took us to La Havre, France, to Camp Lucky Strike. We spent about a week there being fattened. Ice cream stands on every corner, food at every place we went, new uniforms, hot showers, all of the things of life that we had so missed. We had two months leave after we got home. Um, went back to Miami Beach where it all started. Nearly 60 years after his World War II experience, Tom sat down with us at the Warhawk Air Museum in Nampa and we asked, among other things, for his reflection on being shot down, on being a prisoner, on what it felt like for he and his crew to be subjected to what they experienced. The proud moment of my life is that all 10 men came home. We who experienced it can remember World War II with a sense of accomplishment. We did what we had to do for our country. Maybe those who are younger than we, especially those of the Vietnam age, are beginning to know that now and they're beginning to appreciate the sacrifice of life, the endurance of hardships, the putting our lives on hold that we, all of us, men and women, experienced from 1941 to 1946. If they want to call us heroes, we can live with that. As for us who lived during these times and still survive, let us prayerfully reflect upon our experiences, reverently remember our lost comrades, and tell our war stories to anyone who will listen just one more time. And in those times of celebration and commemoration, let us enjoy a moment of pride. Then let us fold our tents and quietly move on for well, there are others behind us from other wars waiting for their day of glory. Heroes too.